what's up everyone how how's it going happy tuesday let me know if you can hear me and see me and see my screen all okay because as you know this is my solo live stream so i am controlling the technical side of things and the art side of things so i hope you're all doing well today thanks to everyone who is joining us live i really appreciate it if you're new here, hi, my name's Ellie. I am a trainer at Maxon and I've started doing perfect. Thanks so much. I'm really glad that you can hear and see me all okay. Also, I made sure that my mic was set up because last time it was not. So yeah, if, you are, if you're new here, I've started doing monthly live streams. And the reason for that is I get quite a few people asking me to do tutorials based on the stuff that I put on like socials on Instagram things like that and so I thought hey why not start live streaming so I can bring these bring these things to you so the idea behind today we're just gonna dive we're gonna dive right in because we've got a whole load of stuff to get through today a whole load of really fun and interesting topics which is which is why I'm really excited about this particular live stream because we're diving into loads of really fun things um, from like modeling to remeshing to a little bit of UVing and then of course into my personal favorite Redshift. So as always, if you have any questions on anything, just let me know. I'm gonna do my best to monitor the chat. If you see me looking over here, it's because I've got you guys all over here in the chat. Uh, also, hey to everyone who's who's joining. Um, hey to Sharon, Anders, Ricky. There, there's so many of you. Eduardo, Jermaine. I feel like I've got to go through now to Brian, Alexander, Bavana, Adi, Joe. Let me see if I can scroll up here. Hey to Hannah and Alexander. It's uh, nice to see you all. Thanks for thanks for letting me know you can hear me as well and you can see me. So this is what we're going to be creating. This sort of uh, inflating balloon cloth animation. I'm just gonna play this through. Hopefully you can all see this fine. So this was just like the social post I created for this particular live stream. So we've got these nice cloth bubble letters that are gonna come in and they're gonna hit each other and bounce off and get a nice little jiggle going on. And so this is what we're gonna create. Um, what's gonna be fun is we're gonna create this from pretty much start to finish. We're gonna model the letters we're then going to fix our topology or our mesh, our mesh density. We're then gonna do some really simple UVing. Uh, so I think when people hear UVing, people get a little bit like panicky. I am one of those people. I do not know much about UVing, but this is gonna be really nice and really simple. Um, I promise you will all be able to do it, even if you've never done UVing before. We're then actually gonna create our own little textures. So. What I did for, for this, once I had like my UV maps or my um, UV sort of uh, layer, I then created a template and then created my own texture inside of Photoshop. So we're gonna do that uh, and it's gonna be fun. And what's gonna be great about that is no one's gonna have that texture. No one's gonna be able to download it online. It's gonna be yours. You're gonna make it right now and I'm gonna make one right now as well. Then we're gonna create our cloth sim. Then we're gonna get into Redshift and we're gonna do some really nice and simple lighting and we're gonna actually build our texture based on that texture map that we created in Photoshop. And then, and then we'll be done, we'll be good to go. And everyone can get on with the rest of their day and we'll have to say goodbye. But for now, let's just dive in. Uh, again, any questions, let me know and I will be monitoring you all over here. So the thing is, when I first created this, I modeled the letters, I modeled the Nike letters. But the thing is, because we don't have a whole load of time uh, and because the process is the same, we're only gonna model one of the letters and we're only gonna remesh and we're gonna UV and texture one of the letters. But the process is the same. So all you have to do is follow the same steps for your letters or for your abstract shapes. You don't have to do letters for this. The beauty of this tutorial is you can pretty much make it your own and sort of on that note, this is actually a variation of Nick at Grayscale Gorilla's pillow tutorial. So I'm sure many, many of you have already seen this because it is an awesome tutorial. So let me find, let me open this up real quick. So this one here, it is such a great tutorial. It dives into loads of different things. And basically this was my version of it 
We're going to be going into a few different techniques and some a few different methods. But if you haven't seen this, I'd seriously recommend uh, checking that out. So shout out to Nick at Grayscale Gorilla for, for that. Cool. So first things first, let's look at modeling our letters. And so, as I said, we're only going to model one, but we're going to model the letter N. And the reason for that is that is going to be out of the four, so out of the N, I, K, and E, it is going to be the most challenging one when it comes to remeshing, edge selections, and UVing. And the reason for that is we don't have a lot of symmetry. But I thought it, would, it wouldn't be right for me to do the easiest one on a live stream. So I thought I'd do the hardest one. And we'll talk about the challenges and everything that we come across when we are using non-symmetrical uh, shapes. So first things first, I am going to remove my work plane because if you've watched a live of mine, you know that I don't really like to work with it. And what we're going to do, if you're not very, if you're not a very advanced modeler, me, I'm one of those people, Cinema 4D has so many great tools and features that just allow us to cut corners and just like artistically build things with shapes and with a volume builder without having to worry about all the kind of advanced modeling techniques that come with traditional modeling. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna come into my front view. Also, I've got a new thing where as I hit my keystrokes, if you keep an eye on the top, it will, it will show them. So any shortcuts I do or anything, uh, don't worry, they'll be showing up at the top as well. I would have thought the K would be more difficult depending on the font. Uh, potentially, but the way I built the K, I'll show you uh, all the letters later anyway, but the K ended up having two planes of symmetry, whereas the N only has one. So the way that we're going to build these is we're going to grab ourselves a capsule. And so I'm going to build these letters sort of like, you know, like the old school, like bubble handwriting. I'm going to build them with capsules. It's going to be nice and simple. And I'm not overly fussed about uh, sort of working to scale because this is a bit of an abstract motion graphics scene. I'm not too fussed about that, but we can talk about all those things again later on. So let me just reduce my radius. Something like 30. And I'm going to come into my capsule and I'm going to increase my height, cap and rotation segments. And this is going to allow me to have a nice sort of uh, high resolution, smooth mesh. And again, all of this stuff, I'm not too worried about the segments because I'm going to remesh everything later on so I can fix my topology later. Again, I don't really need to worry too much about that. So if we just have a little look, let's go 40, 20 and 100. And then all I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste this. So I now have three of these capsule elements. This middle one, what we're going to do, we're going to rotate it. So I'm going to hit the R key. I'm going to rotate it minus 35 degrees. And I'm just going to make it a little bit bigger. So I'm building that N shape effectively. So I'm just going to increase that sizing. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it I'm going to move it over. What we can do, this little button up here, so if I sort of like come into here, this allows me to control my movement on my world or my object uh, coordinates or axis. So if I just click that, I can actually then just move it along. Uh, I just sort of want to move this along to here. And then I'll grab my final one. I'm going to move that along. So I've sort of rotated this slightly. Let's just move that back. And then I can move that over. So now if I come into my perspective view, we can see we're sort of getting that shape. And now we have the letter N. We've been able to create this now uh, nice and easily by just using a couple of primitive shapes that we have available to us inside of Cinema 4D. The trouble is now, it's, it's still, they're, they're three separate elements. They're not actually one individual mesh. And so how can I convert this into one whole mesh? Well, nice and simply, all we need to do is grab something called a volume builder. So if I grab a volume builder, 
And what this does is this is gonna convert any of my geometry into a voxel grid. And then what we can do, we can convert that into a mesh. So the way that this works is we need to put, we need to make things a child of my volume builder. So all the elements I wanna to mesh together, I'm gonna to put inside of the volume builder. So I'm gonna grab everything and I'm gonna drop it inside of here. And straight away, it's looking a little bit strange. And basically what we now have is we have a voxel grid based on this capsule data. And so the voxel size, think of this as the resolution of your mesh. The lower this value, the smaller the voxels are gonna be, and therefore the higher resolution the mesh is gonna be. But I'm not gonna worry about that yet, because first of all, I want to actually convert it into mesh. So let me just grab a quick drink. What we're gonna do is, we're gonna grab the volume mesher. So all of this can be found in the same menu. And then we need to make sure the volume builder is put inside of our volume mesher. Okay, so we have our mesh going on. And if you press NB, it gives you the, like the wireframe view. And so we can see the, the mesh density or the polygons that are making up our geometry. And as we can see here, press NA, we can bring it back. We don't have a very high resolution mesh going on. And that's why we're, get, we're not really getting a very smooth look. We're sort of losing some of that, that N shape. And, and it's looking a little bit, a little bit jaggedy. And so how do we fix this? Well, this is when we wanna come into our voxel size and we're going to want to reduce the, the number here to increase the mesh density. So if I change this value to one, we can now see we're getting a much smoother, and if I press NB now, and a much higher density mesh. Cool, so, we, so we're, we're close to pretty much finishing this off, th this particular letter. But the thing is at the moment, I'm not super happy with it. Like I don't really like these areas in here. I think they're a little bit too, too like janky or jagged. I wanna smooth this out. And we can smooth this out really, really easily by using a smooth filter inside of the volume builder. So what we're gonna do inside of my volume builder, we have these little, these little layers here. And if I just click this one, which is our SCF smooth, it's gonna smooth out my geometry. And I'm happy with the default settings here. So again, like the best part of this, this particular project is a lot of default settings we can, we can leave, which is nice. So this is the first letter. This is how we would build the N. And I'll show you all the other letters as well, um, but we're not necessarily gonna build them now because we wanna get to like all the other, all the other fun stuff. So from here, we have a really high density mesh and we also have what we would call not a very nice or, or not the best topology. And topology are these little sort of um, lines and squares are making up the, the, the geometry here. What we would class, when you hear people talk about good topology, basically what they mean is even quads uh, along the surface of the geometry. That's what we would class as like good topology. I remember I used to hear that all the time when I was first learning like Cinema 4D and I was like, what does good topology mean? Like what is good topology? So yeah, nice even quads is sort of what we're talking about. Definitely don't UV unwrap this. No, definitely don't UV unwrap this. We got some little tricks. Uh, Ricky is definitely right. So I'm gonna go off on a, on a little bit of a tangent here. Like I know we're only 15 minutes in, but hey, it's, it's tangent time and I want to talk about how mesh density is really important when working with things like simulation. So eventually we're going to be converting this into a cloth simulation. So we're going to get our nice bubble letters and they're going to come in and they're going to sort of like jiggle around. Well, the amount of subdivisions that you have is going to play a part in your simulation. Not only the higher 
density, the mesh, the slower things can be. Uh, that's quite like a common thing that we, we already know about. But it also can have an impact on how the cloth simulation um, looks and how the geometry looks. And so I can do a really quick and easy example of this by grabbing a plane, grabbing a cube, and just setting it to 50 by 50 by 50. And then we just sort of pull this one over here and pull this over here and copying this. So we now have, we have these two cubes. Again, I'm gonna hit NB just so we can see our segments or our subdivisions. And this first cube, we're gonna go three by three by three. So you'd say this is relatively low poly, it's low resolution. And we won't go too crazy, let's just go 12 by 12 by 12. So we now have a slightly higher resolution cube here, slightly higher density. Let's just quickly add a collider here. And then we're gonna add a cloth tag. So I've not changed anything else, everything's default. And have a little look at how these now compare to one another. If you press play. So by only changing the amount of subdivisions or the amount of segments, we've massively changed how our cloth simulation looks. And so bear in mind, all the settings are the same, all the settings are default. So this is really important to think about when we are building our geometry or modeling our shapes, letters, etc. Uh, think about the mesh density. And so how can we, how can we solve this? Because one, we're going to be doing our cloth simulation with it. So we need to have a lower uh, resolution mesh for sure. But we also want is we want better topology because when it comes to UV unwrapping, as Ricky said, you definitely don't want to UV unwrap this. We want to have as few polygons as possible and we want to, we want to have as much symmetry as possible to enable us to, uh, to create our edge selections. So we borrowed, we borrowed something from our lovely pals over at ZBrush, uh, which was added into a, one of the, the latest releases, maybe part in the last year. And that is inside of the remesh. So we already had a remesh generator. And what we can do is we now have the Z remesher algorithm and it is an incredible algorithm. And it's gonna allow us to not only control our mesh density, among other things, we can control symmetry and we can also get better looking topology. So if I just sort of like come a little bit closer, we can currently see how this is looking and we can all kind of agree it's not really that great. So if I just drop my volume mesher into my remesh, it's gonna have a little think about it, you know, the amount of um, polygons you've got going on, the longer this is going to take to remesh. <coughs> okay, so immediately, we haven't had to do anything apart from drop the volume mesher inside of the remesh, and we're already now getting better looking topology. So you can see we're getting these nice even quads. But the thing is, it's still too dense. This resolution is still a little bit too high and we want to pull this down, um, mainly so things run faster. And also we just saw how it affected the two cubes. We wanna keep it a little bit more rigid. And again, there's things we can do in the cloth simulation, but all of this stuff we can do now is gonna prevent us from having to fix things later on. So it's always about thinking about the next step. So inside of our remesh, we have the ability to define our mesh density. At the moment, it's set to 100%, so it's the same density it was before. But what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna drop this down to 10%. And you're probably thinking that's really low. And it is really low, but it's still, it's gonna give me exactly what I need. If we just let that sort of kick in, here we go. So if I go at NA, we can see we still have our letter. So we've got a fully formed letter. If we've got a couple little like jagged edges, we're not overly fussed because later on, we will be dropping this into a subdivision surface. So that's gonna save us um, and save some things now. 
what we have is we have a low enough resolution or low enough density that is going to work with our cloth simulation and it's also going to help when it comes to uv unwrapping and so we'll talk about talk about that in a little bit the final thing here the final thing i want to talk about inside of my remesh is these symmetry options and again the more symmetrical your object the more you have the ability to enable these options and we will be enabling one of them in just a sec but what it also means is our topology will therefore be symmetrical as well and so when it comes to again uv unwrapping and creating edge selections and things like that symmetry is your friend the more symmetrical the object the easier things are going to be for us again the reason that i chose the n is because it is the least symmetrical of these letters and it comes with its its challenges and that's you know more fun to do on a live session so with this one we do have one plane of symmetry we do have the z axis or the z axis um so if we basically had this n and if we cut it in half along here we can see that we would have um two pieces that we could identically put together so with that what i want to do is i want to enable my symmetry z and again, it's just going to think about it. And now we have this going on. The thing is, you will know if it's not symmetrical, because if you happen to select one, we can see that, oh, it messes up our mesh. So just make sure that you are enabling the ones that are actually symmetrical. Okay, so this is our letter. This is exactly how I built every single one of those letters. And it's exactly how I would suggest or perhaps recommend um, how to build anything that you're doing for this particular tutorial. If you wanna use abstract shapes, use abstract shapes. If you wanna use letters, build your letters. And so let's have a quick look at all of them. So these were the original letters that I used. As you can see, we've got them all inside of a remesh. And if I just sort of drop these down, we have our individual capsules. We have the volume builder. We have the volume mesher and we have the remesh. So this is the N. The I, the I, we love the I because that's the, the I was, is the perfect shape because if we go to the remesh, we have symmetry across all of our axes and that's, so that's that's so handy and so useful but don't let non-symmetry deter you from creating what you want because there are ways around it this is then the k and again the remesh has two planes of symmetry y and z and then again we have the e made up of more capsules and again symmetry y and z so these are every single one of the letters i created for this particular project what I will do at the end of this, I'll put together a bunch of project files. Um, I didn't quite have time before. I'm sorry, everyone. But what I will do is I'll get project files and I'll put all the letters in um, the remeshed version. I'll then do a UV version. Then I'll do a full project file as well, just so you all have access to it. OK, so. If there are no questions at the moment, which we're, we're looking pretty good at the moment, we can move on to a little bit of UVing. And so what I will say, what I'm about to show you in UVing is pretty much my knowledge on it. Uh, the way that this sort of scene came about was, I was, try I was sort of wanting to learn and understand a little bit about UVing. And I find it easiest when I'm doing it in a project, in a scene, as opposed to just sort of like, reading up about it and then not really putting it into practice and that's kind of how this came about uh and so yeah if you have any questions on UVing feel free to let me know I will do my best to answer them um but if not definitely direct them to the amazing sort of members of the team people like Jonas, uh, Thanasis, Darren they are endless pool of knowledge believe me I I pretty much most of what I know is because of them Cool, so let's get to the UVing part. And so how do we do that? What are the steps for that? 
Well, first of all, what we do need to do is we actually need to bake this down into a single polygonal object. And the way that we can do that is we can right click on our remesh and then we just go to current state to object. And then we can see here, we get a single polygonal version of this whole setup. And what I do like to do, um, and this is a little recommendation, is keep your originals. Keep your original stuff because you never know what can happen. Uh, you never know what you might need to change later on. So always keep a handy little folder with all of your stuff. If you're making it um, editable, keep your procedural version. So this is gonna be my original and I'm just gonna hide that. So we have our N. So UV unwrapping, let's talk about UVing and talk about what it actually means. So the way that you have to think of it is imagine you had like, I don't know, a cardboard box, for example. Actually, we could even, let's use, let's use this. Cool little, hopefully you can all see this. Call it a deck of cards. Let me get on this. Courtesy of Andy Needham, actually, unopened. Uh, so the way that we are going to create our UV map for this is we basically need a flat version of this particular model. So imagine we took this, this box here and we took it apart and we folded it flat. That's basically what the UV map would look like. And then we'd have an individual face for each of these. And on one of these folds, that would be our seam. And so we can kind of put that into practice with this and we can kind of think, okay, if we were to take this apart and have this letter N being on a flat 2D plane, what kind of faces would we have and where would our seams be? So what we're gonna do is we're going to draw edge selections where we think these seams can be or should be. And then we're gonna unwrap based on those selections. And that's gonna be it. So this is probably gonna be the longest, the longest part of the process when you are like doing this yourselves. And it's gonna be the bit that takes a little bit of, um, sort of just like thinking. And what we have to remember is because this isn't symmetrical, I'm just gonna do the best job that I can do. At the end of the day, I'm not worried that it's not gonna be absolutely perfect. I'm gonna just do what I can do with the resources that I have. So first of all, what we need to do is we wanna go on edge mode. And then I'm going to draw where I want the seams to be. And I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna start off by pressing UL and that gives me what's called a loop selection. And you can find that inside of this menu here. And so I'm thinking, so the front and back face are gonna be the easiest. And they're gonna be the first ones that I choose. So let me find until I can get my front face, which is gonna be this one. Okay, don't do what I do and miss. <laughs> okay, so we've got our, you can see we've got our first selection here. And now all I need to do is add to this. So I'm gonna to go to the back and I'm gonna do the same thing and grab the back face. And what we're gonna to do to add this selection is to hold shift and it's gonna add it. If you go wrong, you can just um, command Z or control Z if you're a PC and it will just take it away. But yeah, make sure you're hitting shift to add this in. Cool, so now we have our front and our back face. And so that's great. So those are gonna be my first sort of like flat areas. But the trouble is we now have this whole sort of like outside area of my N. And so we need to, we need to separate this and we need to create some seams as well for here. And this is where things come down to a little bit of, not necessarily guessing, but just sort of working out what you think is gonna work best uh, for these seams. And so I'm thinking these top little areas here if I create some caps, I think it's gonna end up separating my geometry really, really nicely. 
So for this, I don't wanna worry about grabbing a loop selection anymore. I just wanna draw along one of the lines. And the way that I can do that is grabbing something called a path selection. And again, I wanna hit shift and I'm just clicking and dragging. And I'm just drawing where I think this should be. So that's that top one. And then we're gonna come down to the bottom and we're going to do the same kind of thing. So let's grab that one there. Or maybe the one just on the inside. Okay, make sure. So sometimes I found, even when I hit shift, sometimes it doesn't always do it. So if it doesn't, just, you know, undo that and then go back. Okay, so we've got this end one. So that was, that wasn't too challenging, but now this end bit, this is where it's sort of, it's sort of down to you where you think it should be. And so I'm just gonna do a little bit of a rough idea. Maybe we go here and then maybe we go here. Again, just make sure you're hitting shift. This is what I was saying. Sometimes it doesn't always like to work even when I'm hitting shift. There we go, third time lucky. And then the final one I wanna do is just this very top bit up here. What you will wanna do when you're doing it, make sure you're thinking a little bit more than I am right now about it, just to ensure that you're getting the right kind of edge selections on here. I just wanna do this as quickly as possible so you guys aren't you know, bored watching me select loops which isn't super interesting cool so we now have our edge selections set up and we can now see potentially when we unwrap this the different pieces that we're then going to get on our uv layer what i do want to do is come to select and then store selection and what that's going to do it's going to save and it's going to store that edge selection and so if I happen to click off of it, no worries, I've got that selection there saved. And it's also gonna be handy later on when it comes to creating seams in our cloth sim and using certain deformers. Cool. So I did actually do this on all of the letters. So just to give you an idea of what the edge selections looked on across all of the letters. Here they are, here you can see the I, the K, the E. And the more symmetry you have, the, the easier these are going to be to, to choose and select. So for example, on the I, all I did was loop select the front and back face and then the two sort of like top cap areas and it created it perfectly for me. So symmetry was definitely useful here. Cool, so now from here, we can actually UV unwrap this based on this particular thing. So what we can do, like, first of all, let's, let's just see what this looks like. Let's just see what our, uh, our um, UVs look like. So let's throw a little checkerboard on there. Okay, so as we can see, they're not looking that great. The idea is you want this checkerboard to be as sort of uh, even as possible. So as you can see, it's not looking great. So let's, let's fix that. So let's delete that material. I'm actually gonna delete the existing UV tag. We're gonna delete that because we don't need it. We're gonna set them up ourselves now. So we're gonna delete that as well. And we're gonna come into our UV edit layout so just along the top here you have a uv edit layout if i click that we then get given a few different options and don't worry about this i know it can be like if it's the first time that you've clicked on this layout first time you being it can be a little bit overwhelming but basically inside of here this is where we're going to see our um, uvs this is how we're going to get an idea of what they're going to look like on a flat projection and all we need to do is with our letter or model selected, because we still have our edge loop selected, we can unwrap and then we can hit it again just to pull them in tighter in this little layout. 
And then now, hopefully we can get an idea, or hopefully you can see exactly what's happened based on our edge selections. It's almost taken this, this apart and it's given us the different parts of it flat on this layer. And so we can see we have our front face, we have our back face. These two bits in here are the inside areas here. We then have our two sides, which are the outside edges. And then we have our four top areas. That's exactly what we now have. And so there are, there are many, many reasons as to why um, UVing is gonna help us out. For a start, as I added that checkerboard pattern on, you could see how some areas were stretched, some were distorted. That means if I threw a texture on there, those same sort of like stretches and distortions would also be happening to that texture map. So UVing is going to ensure that we get a much nicer look. But what it also means, and what we can also do from here, is we can set up a UV template. We can create a Photoshop template of this UV layer, and then we can bring it into Photoshop and we can then design our own uh, base color texture however we want. And that's what I did on the, on the original. And so there's three steps to do this, only three steps. The first is we're gonna go to File, we're gonna go to New Texture. This is when you're gonna define the resolution. So at the moment I've got 2K, I'll leave it at 2K, that's fine. And then we're gonna name this. So we're gonna call it N uh, color texture. And I'm gonna press OK. We're then gonna to go to layer, so in the same sort of area, create UV mesh layer, that's important. Create UV mesh layer. And you can't really see what it's done, but what it's done is it's created a UV outline of this wireframe. And then finally, we can go to file, save texture as, choose your file format for me because i'm going to be creating this inside of photoshop i'm going to change it as a i'm going to save it as a psd and we're going to go to okay and it's going to come up to save it and we're just going to save it as the n color text and we're going to save that and then let me just open that particular psd file inside photoshop and this is what we now have. We now have our background, which was just that original sort of uh, texture that we created, the gray one. And then we have our UV mesh layer. We also, so we have like a wireframe version now of our model UVs. And the reason this is interesting and the reason that this is sort of um, important is because now we can design or add logos or add anything to this inside of Photoshop and create our texture, which then when we build it inside of Redshift and apply it to our, um, to our model, to our letter, everything that we put here is going to be in that same place, in that same location. So let's just, I mean, we've got, we've got plenty of time. Let's, let's create one just so then we can, we can make sure it matches like later. So, let me just really quickly come into here and let's just save this because we're living on the edge right now. Let's just call it live demo. And let's come back into Photoshop. So what I did do in preparation for this, I thought I grabbed a load of things together. Here we go, yeah. I just threw a bunch of Nike logos and slogans together because it's similar to the original. I wanna try and match the original as close as I can. And then what we're gonna do, we're just gonna add a whole bunch of them and a whole bunch of shapes on here. The important thing to bear in mind is if you go outside of one of these areas, then that's where it's going to be a seam and it's gonna connect with one of the other areas here. So what I'm gonna do actually, I'm gonna lock this UV mesh layer and my background, this is going to be the base color of 
the texture. Um, so let me know in the chat, those of you, if you have a particular color in mind, if you would like it to be gray, if you'd like it to be orange, whatever you want, just let me know. And then we'll start to add some, some fun stuff while I just build this up. So let's just throw in, I'm just gonna copy and paste a bunch of these just to make it nice and, and quick. I'm sure you all don't wanna be watching me build this too long. Purple, of course. We can do purple. Oh, two people saying purple. I mean, we've got to do purple now, haven't we? Uh, what else do we want? What else do we want? Let's go grab this like Be Bold legendary one. I quite like this. And so naturally you're gonna to wanna to spend a lot more time doing, doing these things, but let's just maybe throw that in there. So we will be adding purple, don't you worry. Let's do find your greatness. I quite like this one. So what I love about this is you have full control of exactly where <laughs> purple is ahead. I'm liking the, um, someone put the actual hex code. I like that. <laughs> um, right, yeah. So yeah, if you had like your own logos, your own designs, you can just throw them on here and exactly where I'm putting them on here is where it's going to show up on on here right so let's do what's the last one we could do i mean we could have just do it right that's like the main one right let's just do that let's leave that like that and then we'll do some extra little bits cool so another thing that i do like to do or i did do on the last one was to just throw in some some shapes so let's throw in a couple of let's do a couple of like gray gray squares in here and let me just copy and paste them copy and paste so what we will do in a sec i will actually add some purple so we've got that quite like that so you're probably thinking ellie why didn't you create this earlier and the thing is because it's all based on the edge selections and the uvs that i've just created I didn't necessarily want to worry about creating one earlier. I thought it'd be way more fun just to build one here with you all. Okay, so let's go purple. What kind of purple are we feeling? Are we feeling like a dark? Are we feeling a light? Oh, do you know what? I quite like this. I quite like this purple. I think we might have to go for this. Okay, cool. And then maybe let's do a little bit of just like some some fun like squiggles a little bit in here a little bit in there and then maybe a little bit in in there so we can't go outside the edges yes so the thing is you can go outside the edges so let's say we had a square or or some sort of design that went outside of this edge all it means is this edge here is going to be a seam where the other part of the texture is going to mix. So you then won't see, you won't see this part of it. So you can go outside the lines, that's cool, but it's then not gonna be uh, seen or visible on your texture. So it's up to you how you want to do it. I just keep things inside just because it's nice. You know what? Let's leave it here. Let's leave it there and we can take a look at it. And as Ricky said, if you know what the neighboring UV island is, um, you can line things up. So yeah, if you know uh, which exactly. So, so these bits here are the inside areas of this. So as Ricky said, if you know the neighboring one, then you can make sure things line up. Cool, so we'll leave this as it is because you know we don't want to spend too much time on it. And now we want to save this. A quick tip from me, don't do what I did multiple times. I saved it with the UV mesh layer. And so bear in mind, this is gonna be controlling the base color of our material. So if we leave the UV mesh layer on, we're going to be able to see the UV mesh layer. So disable that and we now have our UV 
texture map. And so if you've ever used um, UV textures before and you see like the base color looks like really strange, there's like patterns everywhere. This is now what we've effectively created. So I'm gonna go file. I'm gonna save this as that same thing. I'm just gonna save as a PNG. And now we've created that. The important thing here, we're gonna cut back to Cinema 4D now. The important thing here is you're going to wanna make sure you do your edge selections and your UV unwrapping and an individual texture layer for each of your letters or each of your models. Because what we've just created inside of Photoshop is based entirely on this UV map. And so as you can imagine, the different letters, these I've already UV'd these ones, again, I'll throw it in the project files. So each of these have their own different UV texture map. So we need to make sure we do that. We do the file, new texture, layer, create UV mesh layer, and then save that out as a template and design them all differently. Cool. So from here, the next step, now we've created our texture maps, is then to start building and start doing our cloth simulation. So what I'm gonna do is, let's do it with all of the letters. So I'm gonna pull in my UV'd letters into, a, into the same scene. Uh, cool, yeah, just it'll look a little bit more interesting to do it with all of them as opposed to just the one. So now what we wanna do is we're going to build our, build the sim. And so the way that we had it before, let me just find that original. So let's just find this, right? So let's just play this again and we can see what we have. Basically all it is, is the letters being individual four corners and they come together and then they dynamically react to one another. And so what we wanna do is we're gonna go back to our front view and we're just going to reposition these letters sort of like this into these sort of four corners. And again, we can move and we can change all of this to change the way our sim looks. But for now, this isn't cool. Let's save that and let's go to NA just so we can see everything. Cool. Now what we wanna do is we're gonna add a cloth tag to every single one of my letters or my objects. So I'm gonna right click, go to simulation, I'm gonna add a cloth tag and it's gonna add it to each of our individual letters. Let's pull that up there just so it reads correctly. And if I press play, straight away, because they are then dynamic, they're gonna be reacting to gravity and forces, they will fall out of the sky. But we don't want that. So if I press Command D, it opens up my project settings and I can actually disable gravity inside of my simulation scene settings. Because what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use forces to control their movement and their position. I'm not worried about them being affected by gravity at all. So now as I press play, nothing happens. They're not simulating at all. So how do we pull them in? Or what can we do to create some movement? There's a variety of different ways. The easiest and simplest way, which is the way that I did, was to use a force and it's a attractor force. So inside my simulate menu, we have forces and we have something called an attractor. And what it's gonna do, it's going to attract my letters together. It's gonna to attract my individual um, simulated geometry. However, what we do need to do is we need to define a space in the middle where the attractor is not going to have an effect. And the reason for that is we can get some, we can get some issues if we don't create this space in the middle because the attractor will continue to pull everything in, in and eventually our geometry will break as soon as it sort of like starts to get really like pulled in together. So we can really easily build this sort of like force field area by coming into the attractor, into the fields menu, 
and then we can go and grab a spherical field. So now we have this inner area. And all we need to do is we just need to remap this. We don't need a, an offset. We don't need any sort of like fall off occurring, which is this like middle area. We can just do that. And then we just want to invert it. So now as I press play, we're getting a little bit of movement. So hopefully you can see we're getting a little bit of movement going on, but it's not pulling it in enough. And from here, this is where we just need to increase the strength of our attractor. And so the important thing here is this strength value will depend on the size of your object and the size of your scene. So at the very beginning, I said I wasn't worried about scene scale and I wasn't. My letters are about 200 by 30 centimeters each. I wasn't too fussed about it. But what that does mean, because they are quite big in size, I do need to increase this strength value. So let's just go add a zero and now we can press play and it's gonna pull everything in. Okay, so, I mean, we're getting, we're getting somewhere, we're getting a cloth simulation, but we're not really getting the kind of design that we're after. We're not really getting a similar design to the original. And the reason for that is because in the original, they're sort of, they're like inflating, they're like balloon letters. Uh, they're not sort of like pieces of cloth that are folding in on themselves. And the way that we can set that up again, nice and nice and simply is by grabbing all of our cloth tags coming into balloon and we can enable balloon. And then we have something called overpressure and think of this as like inflating our geometry. So let's put it on two just to be a little bit dramatic so we can all see what happens. And as I press play, we can see our letters are inflating and then now they come together. Okay, it's, it's looking okay. But what if we wanted to define some scenes, some areas where, you know, the we're gonna have it look like um, sort of like pillows or cushions where we have that like seam and then the inside bit is going to be ballooned and we can do that and there's a, there's a couple of ways that we can do that first of all we can do it in the cloth simulation but then we can also do it with some geometry and so I have to sort of like shout out a couple of people for this so first is a guy called Josh Edwards who sent me a message last night and told me how to create a really cool looking seam on this. And it's perfect timing ready for today's stream. And I told him, I was like, I'm absolutely gonna add this in. So thank you, Josh. And it's also based on a tutorial or part of a tutor tutorial by EJ. So School of Motion, AKA uh, iDesign. This one here, controlling software dynamics using fields. A section of it goes into how you can create a bevel seam uh, in your geometry really, really nicely. And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna look at how we can do that and how we can combine that as geometry, but also inside of our cloth simulation settings as well. So the first thing we do need to do is we're going to be doing this inside of the target length, inside of the cloth tag. But the thing is it needs a map and it needs a vertex map. We're not able to put our edge selection in there. What we can do is we can really easily create a vertex map based on the edge selection. And so remember the edge selection is where our seams are gonna be. And so we want all of this information to match. So let's go into here and we're just going to right click, create a vertex map. We're going to use fields, delete the freeze layer, and then drag and drop in that edge selection. So don't worry if it was fast because we're doing it four times. So we're gonna add a vertex map. We're going to use fields, delete the freeze layer, drop in the edge selection. And then again, we just wanna make sure we've done it on every single one. And then the final one is gonna be that and then click that. Cool. 
So now we have our vertex maps. We're able to use these inside of our target length. So what we're going to do on the N, we're going to drag and drop this vertex map in and I'm going to change my target length to 50%. So now what it's going to do is going to take those edges and it's going to pull them in. It's going to take that weight and it's going to pull it in now. But then the balloon is going to try and inflate at the same time. So as you press play, we're sort of getting those edges in here, but it's still then inflating. And now I can see it's inflating a little bit too much. So I've reduced my overpressure. And this is what we have now going on. And I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm going to now match that on every single one of my letters. So I'm going to come into my cloth tag, change my overpressure to 1.2, drop my vertex map tag in my target length and change it to 50%. And then we're just going to do the same thing on the rest of our letters. If you want them to react differently, then by all means, you can have different settings for each individual letter or object. For me, because they're letters and I want them to match, I'm going to match everything together. And again, I'm not worried about any other settings. Everything else is just completely default. So now as I press play, we can see this is what we have. This is what we have going on. So one final thing I do want to talk about before we sort of actually build these scenes is if you find that your your shapes or your your sort of like cloth letters in this case aren't staying rigid enough there's a little trick we can do inside of our project settings inside of our simulation settings we have something called sub steps and this can work by increasing our sub steps we can actually increase the rigidity of our cloth simulation one thing to bear in mind is the higher the sub steps the more calculations there are so the slower that it can be but it can work as a nice way of just keeping it a little bit like a rigid body. So this is now what we have. Okay. So we're not quite there yet. Not quite satisfied with how this is looking. So what I might do, this is when it comes down to like your artistic preference and deciding you know, what you think looks good. I spent quite a while tweaking the original scene, just sort of playing around with this cloth simulation. I played around with the settings. I rotated these different letters. Um, I played around with the attractor strength quite a lot. I, I even played around a little bit with some of the individual masses of the letters. Um, just to make them like move faster or slower. So if I just sort of pull that in again, I'm not going to spend too much uh, time on perfecting this, but in the original, I absolutely did spend a little bit more time on this. Maybe we sort of pull that in. Okay, right. So for now, I'm just going to let's move on. Let's get to let's get to building our seams and making this look a little bit nicer. So how do we want to do this? At what point do I want to do this? Let's do it at the start of our simulation. So we're going to do this on the end. Again, I'm just going to hit save. So what we're going to do, we're going to create some, we're going to create some beveling based on our edge selection. And it's going to be a really, really nice trick. Again, thanks to Josh Edwards and to EJ for this. And it's going to just look, it's so, it's so quick and easy and it just looks really, really great. Uh, and I didn't do it on the original and I wish I knew about it. Um, I might have to re-render just to get that done. So how do we set this up? Well, actually I might play this through just a little bit, just so I've got um, some of these edges already visible as my cloth sim kicks in. So the first thing we want to do is we want to add a subdivision surface because we can all agree the geometry is not looking very, very smooth. And so what we can do, we can add a subdivision surface to it. And now we're getting much smoother of a geometry. I just held the option key as I grabbed the subdivision surface. And what it does is it adds the object um, automatically as a child. 
But if not, just add your subdivision and then drag and drop your object in there. Cool, so that's the first step. The next step is to then group this into a null. And the reason for that is because we want to add a deformer. So inside of here, we get our deformers and we want it to be on the same level as our subdivision surface. So let's grab our bevel deformer. Uh, pull that out. And we're going to put that in between the null and our subdivision surface. Let's get our settings up. Cool. So we're going to change a few things in here. So we want option and shaping. So if you click and drag, it will open up both of those menus for you inside of the attributes. And at the moment, our component mode is set to edges. And that's perfect because we can drag and drop in our edge selection. Then what we need to do, we need to disable use angle. We're going to disable limit and we're going to change the shape to user. And then what we need to do is we need to define the look of our bevel based on the offset, subdivision, and depth. So having already played around with this earlier, I know that my offset is going to be 0.5. And if we sort of like come in here, we can hopefully see this a little bit better. My subdivisions, this is important because at the moment we can't really see anything because we don't have any subdivisions. I'm going to go to nine. And now we have almost like these like frilly ribbons, which actually look kind of cool, but we're not going to keep them. And the size of this is our depth value. So if I just move this down to point two, we now have our seams going on. So if I go back to the beginning, we can see we have our seams. And as our cloth sim kicks in, we can now do this. Cool. So that was a really kind of like quick and easy way of creating these seams in here. And then what we can do, we can just do this on the rest of our geometry. So I'm going to highlight my letters, throw them into a subdivision surface, and then we're going to group them all inside of nulls. Then I'm going to copy and I'm going to paste my bevel three times because all of my settings are going to be the same. The only thing I'm going to change is the edge selection. So on this bevel, we're going to drop in the eye edge selection. And then that goes in between the eye. Now we've got that there. On this one, we're going to put in our K edge selection. And we're going to put that inside of here. And we've got our K. And then finally, we just want to throw in the E onto this one. And then that can go in there. Cool, so this is what we have going on right now. One thing I will say is to speed up your sim, because as you can imagine, you know, subdivision surface and deformation uh, isn't super fast inside of here. So I would just run your sim as normal and then we can just sort of find like a cool stopping point, maybe something like that. And then we can re-enable these and we can see how this is looking. Cool. So that was pretty much the like the Cinema 4D side of things. So we looked at how we'd model the the letter N, and then we also had a quick look at how we'd model the other letters. You know, using um, simple primitive shapes or objects, throwing it into a volume builder and volume mesher, then using our lovely uh, Z remesher algorithm to fix our topology. We then created our edge selections, which were our seams which we then used to unwrap our model. And we brought that into Photoshop. We created the texture for the letter N. So remember this was that texture that we created. So thank you to, to those of you that suggested purple. Um, I, I like it, I'm, I'm feeling the color. I like it a lot. And then we came back in and then we created our cloth simulation again just really nice and simple. We haven't really dove too much into the technical settings, which is what I love about this particular setup and this particular tutorial. It's just a load of really fun features um, put together to create something really fun and creative and interesting. And then what we did was we created our subdivisions and our bevels and our seams. 
So from here, what we're going to do, so we're about, we're about five past. So let's, let's do some redshift. Let's add some lighting. Let's put our texture together because I mean, we made it. So we better, we better put it in here. We're going to create a little fabric texture and then we're going to be pretty much good to go. And hopefully it'll be nice to see uh, your versions of this at some point over socials. So let me just save this. Um, and at this point, now what we want to do, we're going to come into our render settings. And as you can see, so far, we've just been, we haven't changed our render at all. I haven't needed to change this to Redshift because I haven't been doing anything Redshift. Um, and that's a, that's a tip I like to do. So thanks to Jonas who told me about this. Because when you change your render to Redshift, it's going to take like 90% of your GPU power. So when it comes to things like, you know, like pyro and like simulations that are on the GPU, you're having to share that, that memory and that power. And so if you're just working in the cinema, don't worry about changing your renderer until this point. So now let's change it to Redshift. Um, and let's just do like, let's do a little like Instagram thing, shall we? A little, little one by one ratio. And not gonna change anything else, gonna leave it as it is for now. I'm gonna throw in a Redshift camera and I'm just gonna sort of line up a composition a little bit similar to the one that we did before. So it's a little bit sort of like, like this. Again, we don't wanna spend too much time on it because I wanna get to some nice and simple lighting and then some nice material creation as well. Cool, right, so let's maybe do like this. And then we're gonna grab our good old Redshift render view. So I personally like to have the render view up some people use the viewport IPR, some people use the render view. It's personal preference, it's whatever you want to do. Down to you. So I'm just gonna kick this off. And we can probably agree it's not looking that great. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna start off by adding some lighting. So my first thing is I like to throw in a dome light and it just creates some really nice like overall ambient lighting. And it also means I can add in a HDR image. So we can come up, do we zoom? We could come up to the asset browser and we can search HDR and you can drag and drop your own HDR image in here. Or if you have your own on your machine, you can use those. And so I actually have a few resources somewhere in here with this HDRI free pack. I'll link to this as well in the description. So it's this, Mr. MR HDRI free pack. And I'm gonna grab Bathroom Hard Pierre HDR. I'm just gonna drag and drop that into the texture, let that load, and now we have this, casting some natural light inside of here. Then what we can do, we can just rotate this dome light until we are happy with how this is looking so maybe we sort of like come around something like something like that looks pretty cool one thing i will say so i apologize for these little little artifacts here it's a it's a little bit of a bug with the gpu that i'm using um i will be moving over to a different machine very soon uh, so hopefully you won't be able to see those anymore but they're here for today so i apologize cool so let's just disable this background we don't need to see that my little a little hack that I love to do, this is like my generic setup for a lot of things I create, is to grab a plane, put it as a child of my camera. Um, sort my rotation out slightly. And then we should be able to pull it down and it just works as like a really like simple background just by like pulling this back. Cool. So yeah, these marks aren't ideal, but hopefully we'll still be able to see everything that we need to do. Cool. So my next go-to at this point, once I've done my dome light, is to actually use a bounce card. And I find it like a really nice way. If I line it where my shadows are happening, so on this left-hand side here, if I add another plane and just sort of like rough, roughly like reposition this over here and maybe enlarge it, we're now getting that additional bounce on here. So if I disable my plane, if you keep an eye on this sort of left-hand side and 
enable it. What's happening is the light from the dome light is now hitting that bounce card and it's then hitting that shadowed area, creating a slightly brighter area without me having to do like a fill light. From here, let's just throw in a couple of area lights to finish this, this off and then we'll look at creating the texture. So inside of this menu, we're gonna grab our lights and I'm just gonna grab an area light. So the thing is with this setup, if you're pretty new to Redshift or you've not been using Redshift uh, too much, this is a really nice quick lighting setup that will still make everything look nice, but you're not having to worry about doing too much. We're just sort of going to a dome light with our HDR, we've got a little bounce card and then we're gonna use some area lights. That's gonna be it. So inside my area light, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reposition this by using a target and this is also today's quick tip, which should have been posted, uh, I think an hour and 10 minutes ago. Again, thank you to Jonas for telling me this in the week and it blew my mind. So pretty much everyone who watches any of my training knows I love an area light with a target tag and a null. It's a really nice, easy way of repositioning lights. It takes a couple of steps, but it's not too bad. But what I didn't know a few days ago was if you, inside of your area light, or inside of any light inside of Redshift, if you hit this little button here, so this little arrow here, you get add target tag and null. And what it does is it automatically adds the target tag connected to the null for us. And I'm sure a lot of you are probably screaming at the screen saying, Ellie, I can't believe you didn't know that. Well, I didn't, and my mind is blown, and I'm gonna be using it every single day now. So what we can do, I'm gonna reposition my my null just to the front of here. I'm going to just decrease the intensity and the size of my light. And I'm just gonna reposition this perhaps over here. And the reason for adding an area light, not only because we're able to obviously then increase the intensity of our lighting and etc., things like that, but it also helps when we're adding like bump and surface detail. I find using an area light brings out more of that detail than say just a dome light. So let's sort of like pull this back. And then finally, we're gonna add a little, like tiny little rim light um, to the side. So let's just add another area light. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna disable my other lights just so we can see how this looks. Make it all nice and like skinny, a little skinny light, just to create this nice little edge on here. Again, reduce this down slightly, and then let's add some color. So we went with purple, didn't we? We went with purple. So let's add a little like purple, little purple color inside of here. Yeah, there we go. Again, it's all down to you. Like you guys are the artists at the end of the day. Just see what looks good. See what you like playing with. Cool, yeah, now we've got that nice little rim light on the left. This is cool. So of course, this is gonna look completely different when we add our textures. We only have the one texture to create, but again, just like every other step, the process is the same. So you'd have had your texture maps that you've created, your UV texture layer that you've then brought into Photoshop. You'd have each individual one on here. And I'm gonna show you how to put them together now. So we're gonna create a new material, we don't need that one now. Create a new standard redshift material by double clicking. And then what we're gonna do, let's just save this again, just in case. I'm gonna throw this onto the end and it's just gonna sort of like come out. Uh, so really quickly, let's just sort of pull these back in only cause I want it to be like super fast. So let's play this in quickly and see what this looks like smush together. Okay, let's leave that like that. Again, pull everything back on, pull everything back on. And now let's create our texture, cool. So what we can do is, this is where it's entirely down to you. You can use like fabric texture maps. So I wanna create like a fabric or a cloth material, right? That's what we're gonna be doing. And that's what I did for the original. So, you can use 
online resources. So I'm a big fan of like Ambient CG, you got Polygon. We also recently released a whole bunch of fabric textures inside the asset browser. So feel free to use those. And because we UV'd it, everything is going to sort of project relatively well. Of course, where you get the seams, we're gonna get the, the seam in the texture map too. But I thought I'd also take the opportunity to build a procedural fabric or cloth texture using some of the um, new-ish sh shaders. So how would we do that? Well, let's just sort of drop that down there. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab the tiles shader. And if I solo this, we can see how, we can. you can see now where that seam and what exactly that seam is doing. The thing is if we scale our uh, shader down enough, chances are you're not going to notice. And again, we're not going for perfection. We're going for good enough, looks good enough. That's, that's, my, uh, that's my style. So let's get into here and let's just change some of these colors. So we're gonna go black and white. So our grout color is black and then our tile color is white. We're then gonna change this to weave and we're going to drop this scale all the way down to 0.5. And what I might even do is get a little bit closer so hopefully you can all see. So what I will say in the original, I went a lot smaller with the scale, but I want everyone to be able to see it on the stream. So I'm gonna to stick to a scale of 0 0.05. And then what I'm gonna do is I wanna create the like additional sort of um, surface texture bits. Cause at the moment it's not gonna be looking that interesting, but if we combine it with a max on noise, we can start to create some of those um, more interesting elements. So again, if you wanna just see how everything is looking, you can hit this little S key. So S key here is gonna solo it inside of your render view and you can see exactly how it looks. So that's a little, uh, a little tip I love to do. And again, personal preference. I'm gonna choose uh, the noise electric. I'm gonna come down and I'm gonna remap my scale to something like 0.5. And so now we can start to see how this is gonna look. And then we can even uh, control or remap the output, which is like your low, high brightness and contrast. It will basically be controlling the grayscale values. So I'm just gonna make this, I'm just gonna increase my brightness and increase my contrast. And now what we can do is we can actually combine and blend these two elements together to effectively create our own interesting fabric uh, bump map. So the way that we do this is we grab something called a color layer and the color layer is, is sort of similar to Photoshop. Basically you're enabled to, you're able to layer up certain elements and then you can define the masking and the blending mode just like you do in Photoshop. So what we can do is we'll connect our tiles to our base color. So that first input, and then we can connect our max on noise to our layer color one. And if we solo this, at the moment, nothing's really happening. And that's because we need to define our blending mode and set that to multiply. And now what we have is our is a combination of our tile shader and our max on noise. And the final step in this particular part is to then just grab a bump map node because we're gonna then tell Redshift, all right, cool, we want this whole setup to be considered as a bump map. And now we've nice and easily created our own procedural fabric texture. And so I'm all for texture maps. Like I love, it. I love a good texture map, but I thought it'd be fun to take advantage of some of the shaders and the possibilities inside of Redshift itself. So we've almost done, we're nearly done. We're also nearly out of time. Before we throw our texture map on there, cause that's gonna be the bit, that's gonna be like the bit where everyone's going, oh my God, this is so cool. Um, we do want to just change a few of our base settings inside of here. So I'm getting really into this new diffuse model. So Lambertian spheres, basically if you're creating like really porous materials, so like sand, this is a really nice diffuse model, but I'm finding lately for like fabrics, it just looks like it looks so good. It just makes you want to like touch it. So I'm gonna change that diffuse model. I'm then gonna change my roughness something like 0.8 and you can just 
like it just looks like really really nice like i really like it and then if we want to if we find the bump is a little bit too much we can just decrease this a little bit and we can even use this as displacement as well i'm not going to worry about doing that um, there is a quick tip on how to set up displacement basically you can just use this same setup add a displacement node make sure you add your rs object tag and then you can make some like geometry displacement as well but what I do want to do is I want to take the texture map that we created maybe about an hour ago and I want to put it in here. So this was the texture map we created, this one here. So thank you to those of you who suggested purple. I love it. And we just threw a few things on, you know, we didn't want to spend too much time on it. But again, the more time you spend, the better they're going to look and the better it's going to look inside of Cinema 4D and Redshift. So let's throw our texture, we just drag and drop that into here. Change our color space to sRGB because it's going to be controlling a color input. And then plug that into our base color. And then now we have that over the top of here and exactly where we put those things inside of here. So remember, if we go to our UV mesh layer, so we can now see this is how it's projecting onto our object. So if we come back into here, we could even sort of like maybe go back. And have a quick look at it. This is what we have on here. And then as it begins to interact as a cloth simulation, let me just let it play it through just a couple of seconds. We now have this in here. And so imagine we'd done every single letter like we did in the original. We'd be able to build this material on each individual letter, have each individual texture map controlling the base color um, exactly how we wanted it and then you know it's completely original completely unique because you've just built them you've just created them yourself <laughs> thanks for the lovely comments everyone it's so good i'm at home screaming i would be too don't worry <laughs> makes me want to make gloves out of that cloth yes it's really nice isn't it so i'm all for a texture map but i definitely like to to try and play as much as I can inside of shaders as well. So we're pretty much at time and, and this is exactly how I set up that original. So if we sort of like come back into here, you can see the concept is the same. We've got our modeled letters, just sort of like change a little bit of the, of the cloth simulation and then, as you can see, slightly different looking textures, but all built in the same way, all using that um, text map layer, all inside of Photoshop, then all brought inside of here and then created our little our little fabric texture. And then when it came to rendering, um, I mean, my settings were were relatively simple. I just I do brute force and, and brute force. And then my trace steps, which are your, your GI bounces, I went to, I think about six, and then my brute force rays were 1024. And that was literally the settings that I used for that final one. Again, nothing too technical, just a fun, creative sort of play inside the software to create something interesting. I guess, does anyone have any questions? Thank you so much to who's here watching live. Uh, thank you for all your lovely comments as always. I really do appreciate it. And thanks to, I believe it's probably Jonas in the chat under Max on training team. If so, thank you so much for, for being here. And what I'll do, so I'll put together a bunch of these project files and I'll separate them out. So I'll do a full final one, which has everything so it has all of the, the letters, the, the UVing, the textures, the lighting, everything. But what I'll also do is I'll do a separate one with just the letters modeled and just the UV'd letters. So you can break them down, you can dive into it, you can create your own textures and do whatever you want, or just follow the, the process and the steps and build your own version. So your own letters, you can do logos, you could do abstract shapes, and then basically just 
follow the exact same process here and create a fun version. So that being said, if we just don't forget, don't forget all the stuff that happens on the Maxon training team, you can find on the Maxon website under the events page. So starting Monday, I believe, yeah, we have a brand new Demystifying series. So universe for editors. We also have some pretty cool guests coming up. So we had uh, Nick the other day on Ask the Trainer. We've also got Chris Schmidt. And I believe we do have someone else, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say it yet. So I'm not going to say it. So definitely check out the Max on Events page. And remember, everything we do is uploaded onto the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. And then as always, feel free to follow us on socials or follow me on socials. I'm at It Was Ellie. And all of these streams, all these sessions, all the stuff that I talk about, I'll, I post on there, I post quick tips. Um, and any tutorial suggestions, I will bear in mind for future live streams. So definitely uh, hit me up on there if you, wanna, if you wanna know anything. But as always, thank you so much for everyone being part of this session. I hope you enjoyed it. And I will catch you on, on another one soon. So bye everyone. Have a good rest of your day and week. And I'll see you soon.